I'd like to I'd like to talk about uh, a very new way of investigating. The way citizen journalism investigations are trusted is different than professional journalism. Don't believe me? Here's the evidence. So there we see the bigger impacts here. There's one. This is James Rack for you. They've made sure they've got wind blowing in. Like a time machine, we can go back to the day of the MX-17 shootdown on Google Earth. The fake media tried to stop us, but I'm president and they're not. Right now, they're winning. So we need people fighting against that. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis. That sound you just heard was a YouTube video by an organization called Bellingcat, which has remarkably uncovered some incredible truths in the investigations ranging from Syria to Russia and even America. By using open source intelligence, mostly, they were able to show the Syrian regime of Assad used chemical weapons on his own people. Their investigation accusing Russia of firing an anti-aircraft missile which brought down a passenger airliner over Ukraine stood up to international scrutiny. Then they have identified Russian agents who poisoned an ex-Russian spy in Salisbury, England. In the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, they tracked and identified a kill squad of FSB agents who were following Navalny and tried to poison him. And now one of their main investigators tells me more investigations soon to be released will show the Russians murdered more people, including those who have tried to tell the truth about illegal doping by Russian athletes. This is not just another investigative news site. It uses electronic intelligence gathering from the Internet. That's called OSINT. And on this backstory, we talk to one of the founders of Bellingcat. All right, I want you to meet Elliot Higgins, who is a citizen journalist, but an unusual one. Hi, Elliot, and you're in uh, Lister, England. Yes, right, yes. So you've just written a book called We Are Bellingcat, an intelligence agency for the people. What are the other intelligence agencies for? Uh, well, I think they serve uh, power in the government, really. Um, one reason we're saying it's for the people is it's not just about giving information to the public. It's about involving people in the investigation process itself. So things like crowdsourcing, uh, collaborations with other people and volunteering is a very big part of what we do at Bellingcat. I was talking to somebody about doing this interview and I said, look, they're really remarkable because they use something called OSINT, which is open source intelligence. And that that person responded and said, oh, yeah, there's a lot of great investigative websites right now and people who go and investigate on, you know, prison sentences and all of that. Look, this is very different, though, because what you're and you can explain it to me, what you're doing is you're accessing open source intelligence on the Internet um, and very sophisticated things like geolocating on cell phones, for instance. Yes. So um, basically, we use anything that's publicly available information, and most of it is online because of the rise of um, basically the use of smartphones since 2008, the availability of satellite imagery from places like Google Earth and information like Google Street View imagery. We now have a massive resource coming from people of uh, about incidents that are happening on the ground. So if there's a, you know, if there's a bombing in Syria, people film it and share it online. If there's, you know, a, a riot in Washington, D.C. and the Capitol building gets attacked lots of those people share that online so we can collect all that information together but we also have things like satellite imagery the google street view imagery um, other information that we can use to cross reference and confirm exactly where this stuff was filmed and start basically piecing together these kind of fragments of information and revealing kind of the network of digital connections between them that allows us to have this view of actually what happened on the ground so talk me through a couple of these let's let's talk about syria and the use of chemical weapons. I mean, you were able to pinpoint the fact that it came from the government, that these these chemical weapon explosions, chlorine, et cetera, were being launched by the Assad government. How were you able to do that? 
So from about 2013, mm -hmm. the late 2012, we started seeing more and more accusations of chemical weapons being used in Syria. And um, at that time, I was blogging under the name of Brown Moses, after named after a Frank Zappa song. It was really just a hobby. And I was just interested in what these videos were showing us about the conflict in Syria. And um, more and more videos started appearing of these kind of weird looking munitions. Um, but no one was really taking it that seriously until um, the August 21st, 2013 sound attack in Damascus, where there was a massive number of casualties, but also a massive amount of videos published online. There were about 200 videos in total shared from that day, showing victims, showing the symptoms, and also showing the munitions that were used. And these munitions, they were very odd looking things. They were kind of very tubular. Um, they looked clearly like they had contained something and had burst open, but they also didn't look like what you'd expect to see as a conventional munition. But that led to some people saying, well, these look like they've been kind of DIY, kind of manufactured by the rebel groups. with no real evidence to support that, but they just made that assumption. But I had actually seen these rockets before being used in videos by government forces. And, you know, the videos filmed by rebel groups showing the kind of detonated remains of these same kind of missiles. And that was kind of one of the first clues that these missiles were from go government forces. We then had the fact that sound was used, which is not something that's easy to produce. And because we knew a certain number of these rockets were used and the kind of container section of these rockets, which were partly intact, would have a certain volume, they would have required to have manufactured a huge amount of sound to fill them. And that process itself would require you know, very complex kind of production process, a lot of very difficult to get materials. So the idea that some kind of jihadis in Syria had, you know, put together sarin in a bathtub and then made these munitions was increasingly ridiculous. Yet this was the story that some people continued to push. Let's talk about Ukraine. July 17th, 2014, MH17 is downed. The Russians, of course, deny that they had anything to do with it. 283 passengers, 15 crew killed huge um, disaster um, and you were able to you know very quickly trace that to a Russian uh, anti-aircraft platform and what made you so sure of of the idea that it was Russians that did it so this investigation kind of happened in a number of stages. The first stage were, was directly after the aircraft was shot down, where people started finding online videos and photographs of book missile launches. And some of them were claimed to have been in eastern Ukraine in separatist territory. So the first thing I did and the kind of community of people that kind of grew around that incident did is try to figure out where they were taken using the same techniques I'd previously used in Syria. So looking at satellite information, clues in the photographs, and we could establish exactly where these were taken. Then because we had the exact location, some of these were taken at times where there was bright sunlight, which meant there were shadows. So you could use that as a sundial and figure out the approximate time of day. And from that, we could establish a route this missile launcher traveled on the morning of July 17th towards a site which people had photographed. There was satellite imagery of that indicated it was a launch site. Now, that started to give us a sense that this was the missile launcher responsible for shooting get down MH17. But where did it come from? Was it one that was captured from Ukraine? Was it one that could be from Russia, as some people claimed? Now, among these videos of book missile launchers were ones that were filmed in Russia in June 2014. And it showed a convoy of vehicles heading from the 53rd Air Defense Brigade in, uh, in Russia, in Kursk, down to the border of Ukraine. And we know that because, again, we geolocated it. We looked at the 53rd Air Defense Brigade's uh, website, which had all their book missile launchers featured. And we discovered one of these missile launchers had markings and features, scratches, dents, painted uh, markings that matched perfectly with the markings on the missile launcher that we saw in Ukraine in July 17th. And we compared other missile launchers just in case there might be similar matches, but none of them had the same level of matches as these two missile launchers, one in Ukraine and one in Russia. So the conclusion was it was the same missile launcher. And, you know, since we've kept investigating, we've discovered more evidence of Russia's involvement in the conflict in Ukraine, that they were sending tanks, other missile systems over to Ukraine. So in a sense, this one missile launcher was only really unusual because it shot down in an airliner, not because it was a military equipment being sent over the border from Russia to Ukraine. So is this a new, I mean, that stuff's incredible, I, I find, right? And is, is this a new craft? Or are you simply borrowing on the kinds of things that intelligence agencies have done for years behind the, the curtain, uh, but you are using public source uh, information. 
I mean, there's always been kind of satellite imagery analysis and things like that done right. by the kind of intelligence services. But what I think makes this unique and what has changed so much is just the massive availability of information from the ground and the massive amount of sources that allow you to verify that information. So rather than just having one video and saying, well, we can figure this out from the video, you have one video that might lead you to social media posts that lead to more videos and photographs. And you start basically building this network of information around an incident. It's almost like if there's an incident in the real world, it leaves kind of ripples in the digital world. And we're identifying those ripples and kind of following them back to the source to find out what actually happened. Um, and this has been applicable not just to the conflict in Syria and Ukraine. I mean, now we're seeing news organizations and we're doing it as well, looking at the January 6th uh, violence in the capital and using all this video footage, often filmed by the perpetrators, to show exactly what happened, what these people are actually doing. And in a sense, there's you know, direct parallels between those sorts of investigations and the investigations we do into things like airliners being shot down or chemical weapons being used. On the Capitol... Uh, any doubt in your mind that this this was organized from the Trump administration? Or is that where you're looking at? It's, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, organized might be a strong word. I mean, heavily influenced might be the best way to think. I mean, there were so many different groups who made up that crowd. Some of them had their own agendas. I mean, there were a lot of people like the Proud Boys who have sought out this kind of political violence. There are people who were kind of part of the QAnon movement who believed President Trump was going to save America for, from satanic paedophiles. And they, uh, you know, Trump had many opportunities to say, no, I'm not really saving America from America. You know, satanic paedophiles, this is completely made up. But he didn't. He kind of said, well, they must be good people because they say I'm a genius and that kind of thing. There were all kinds of different groups that made up that mob. So I think it's more complicated than just saying, oh, you know, they was, you know, it's just one kind of massive people who were kind of directed by Trump. Some of the people who were leading the violence turned up at you know the barriers with the police and broke through them before Trump was even speaking. So the idea that Trump was directly responsible for all the violence, I don't think it's true, but he was certainly uh, influence in the violence, I would say. But your, your investigation will show certain people, certain organizations kind of on the tip of the spear uh, crashing through the windows and the doors of the Capitol. Yeah, and you see groups like the Proud Boys, these far right groups leading a lot of that violence. But once the crowds had gathered and events were progressing, they were getting angrier and angrier. And that's where you started seeing kind of almost organic leadership kind of emerging, certain individuals grabbing megaphones and shouting, you know, it's time to take back our democracy. Mm -hmm. And they had a whole range of different backgrounds. Um, but you did definitely see people who are known for violence, for tar targeted political violence, who were discussing this beforehand. Um, but I, I think it's always with these groups, and it's the same when we talk about kind of Russian influence on elections or whatever it may be, mm. there are groups online who kind of self-radicalize. And we need to kind of recognize that's something that's happening on online communities, not just something that's been, you know, influenced by outside influences like what Trump yeah. may or may well, I mean, be saying. This, this, is, this kind of brings me to why I wanted to interview you, because I am deeply disturbed as somebody who has worked in media for 40 plus years now about the internet and the radicalization and the misinformation uh, on the inter internet, like, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and you mentioned QAnon and deep conspiracy theories and lasers from space. And I mean, there is so much crap, but you kind of make the point in the book that in fact, this open source um, incredible thing called the internet actually is quite positive and it has, it leads to more truth, not less. Would, is that fair? I think so. Yeah. It, I mean, there's good and bad to what the internet allows us to do. It allows us to kind of work collaboratively, you know, do the kind of work Bellingcat is doing, gives us access to information we can analyze. that's completely unique to this kind of last 10 year period. On the other hand, the internet is also very good for people to find like-minded people who, you know, might think that the earth is flat or that, you know, coronavirus is fake or Bill Chip Bill Gates wants to put microchips into people, and you'll find a like-minded community. And it, it it's Elon Musk they, now. It's not Bill Gates, apparently. So, oh, he's moved on now. Okay, <laughs> he's he's got a promotion in the world. Um, it, it's like um, if you have an opinion and you're like, say, okay, the earth is flat. You'll find a website that tells you the earth is flat and reinforces that opinion. You'll find a whole community of people. You'll find websites, celebrities, you know, people are saying the earth is flat, the earth is flat. 
eventually you can convince yourself, yes, the earth is really fat and that there is a conspiracy against us by these kind of mainstream folks who mm -hmm. want to keep the truth from us. Now, if you say, oh, maybe the earth isn't flat or maybe, you know, that you come up with some slight variance on what the kind of group think is, you get pushed out of that group. Or if you become too extreme, you find another group that's even more extreme. And that's true for all kinds of conspiracy theories. I've seen with chemical weapon use in Syria, there's a kind of anti uh, kind of uh, white helmets, anti kind of imperialist in quotation marks, pro acid, pro Putin community who completely rejects the idea that chemical weapons are being used. And I've seen people, you know, kind of questioning, or oh, maybe there are chemical weapons being used in those groups and then getting attacked, forced out of the group. And what happens is basically extremism, radicalization gets rewarded by this kind of group thing. And that creates very dangerous communities who start believing that they're the truth seekers. They're, so, they're the ones who only really care about the truth and everyone outside their group are against them that they're attacking. And it happens with chemical weapons attacks. It happens with MH17. It happens with QAnon. It happens with Trumpism. It happens everywhere. And part of that is because I think social media companies, tech platforms are designed around recommended content to people. They really only care about you as a kind of digital soul they can sell advertising to. So once you've sold your digital soul to them, they'll give you whatever you want to look at and what they think you want to look at. And if you're clicking on QAnon links, if you're clicking on Flat Earth links, you'll get algorithm. more information. Algorithms, yeah, which, are, which yeah. is, and then, and then there's dangerous echo chambers. So on the Sergei Skripal case, which was here in England in Salisbury, uh, you were able to identify the GRU agents uh, who actually came here, traveled here, administered uh, the Novichok nerve agent to the door of the Scripples, I believe. Uh, again, an, a pretty incredible investigation. Yeah, and that one kind of moved us out of um, purely using open source material because Russia, rather uniquely as a country, it's, it's both a police state and also an incredibly corrupt police state. So they collect a lot of information on their citizens and then the kind of people working in the bureaucracy you know, make this information available in various ways. Um, so we were able to get information like phone records, travel records. There were all kinds of leaked databases online that had been floating around for several years of house registrations. Just every kind of scrap of information you could Im imagine was either leaked or, you know, for sale on the internet. Now, we would normally not buy information like that because, you know, we prefer open sources. But given the kind of unique fact, these were Russian spies who were obviously trying to keep off the line. And we had kind of clues, in, we, we knew we could get these resources and look into them. And what that allowed us to do is using kind of details from kind of the scraps of information that were published by the government, some information from Russian investigators who got their passport numbers, for example, we could find the passport registration mm -hmm. documents for these people. And when we got them, they were stamped with things saying that like the phone number of the Russian Ministry of Defense and uh, do not share information and all these kind of very official looking stamps that were different from what you would find on a normal document and we dug into them more and more and we discovered that um, one of them um, had their fake identity set up using a pattern where they had the same date of birth the same first name and the same place of birth and by looking for all these house registration da databases car registrations and all these kind of this information we managed to find uh, people with the same date of birth the same first name and the same place of birth about a dozen people we worked through that list. We found 11 of them on social media profiles. They were real people and they had different photographs, but one person was a ghost. We then got his records and it had exactly the same photograph as the person who was on Russia Today saying I was a sports nutrition salesman a few days earlier. Um, so that ended up allowing us to identify not only those suspects, but then start exploring this network of basically a Russian GRU nerve agent assassination squad and that led us to a further poisoning in bulgaria a few years earlier of a bulgarian arms dealer which involved some of the same people involved with the scripple poisoning so and this is still an ongoing investigation where we're discovering more and more poisoning incidents both in russia and abroad right and then that's why there are a lot of parallels to what you were able to uncover on alexei navalny's poisoning again with novichok and again, with the security services, although in this case, they are FSB agents that you've identified. And again, you've used phone records to show that he was under surveillance, uh, that those same people were there when he was poisoned. Uh, you've tracked them. You know, tell me if I'm wrong in any of this stuff. You've tracked them to a lab in Moscow uh, where this Novichok was likely stored, maybe manufactured. I mean, you have a lot of incredible detail in that investigation that has been very embarrassing for the FSB. 
Yes, so um, the kind of common thread there between the GRU poisonings like the Skripal and Bulgaria poisoning and what happened in Russia was these chemi chemistry labs where it looks like when the Novichok program Russia had was shut down as part of their membership of the Chemical Weapons Convention, the scientists were moved to these new laboratories. Funnily enough, one of them was claiming to manufacture sports nutrition drinks like the uh, Skripal poisoning suspect said they were selling sports nutrition. So there's a kind of weird kind of parallel there. But um, we've not only discovered that Navalny was followed by this FSB team of uh, about an eight to a dozen members on about 40 different trips since 2017. Yeah, four years, just not four months. Yeah, so it was a long time. And um, it, it appears his wife fell ill in July of last year with a mysterious illness. She recovered fairly quickly, but when Navani was poisoned, they realized the symptoms were slightly lesser than the ones he had experienced. It seemed like a kind of threshold dose she may have received with his poisoning. We've also discovered the same, the same FSB kill squad followed three other individuals who died under mysterious circumstances, two of which had puncture marks in their armpits when they were discovered. Um, and in fact, the investigation that examined one of these uh, victims was um, the investigation into the blood works was actually led by the leader of this same assassination team who said there was nothing, you know, there's nothing detected in his blood. We're now discovering even more cases of um, failed assassinations and successful assassinations of other people, and we'll be publishing about those in the coming weeks. How many? I think we're up to at least um, one failed and two more successful assassinations, plus several more suspected assassinations. But so how many when you add them all together with the ones we... Oh, gosh. Um, I think it, we're around seven or eight so far, and we've probably got three or four that we suspect. And this is over Are a question all... of... Elliot, sorry, are they all political opponents of Putin's or what, what is the pattern there? No, in fact, um, we haven't published, I can't go into too much details, but one of the people we're looking into is not a political figure. Um, he's more of an arts figure who was critical of uh, Putin through his arts. So it's not just about uh, targeting people like Navalny, these big opposition figures. I mean, the three people who were assassinated two of them were quite small kind of level activists in the Caucasus. One of them was actually an official member of the kind of official Russian opposition. Um, the people we're looking into now, look, it looks like they were related to the Russian anti-doping agency and they died just as they were saying they were going to reveal, you know, about the whole um, anti-doping issue there. So it, it's not just about political figures. It's about anyone who's embarrassing the Russian government. It's, it's quite frightening as well because I think maybe in Russia, there's a perception if you're powerful, if you're a powerful figure and you're going against the government, then you are going to be kind of targeted like we saw with Navalny. But this is showing more and more. It's not just about the big, important people. It's about people at every level of society. And I think in a way that's kind of more frightening than just being major political figures. It's like anyone is at risk if you're critical of the government. It's incredibly, I mean, it's astounding, scandalous um, and the road seemed to lead to very high approval. The one thing that Bellingcat will not be able to give us is who gave the final approval uh, on these. And uh, obviously, Navalny says it was President Putin, um, but we, we will never know, right? You'll never get that far. Well, I mean, one thing to consider is these um, units, they were in com um, communication with their commanders. And those commanders, often around the time of these poisonings, were in communication with much higher level people in the FSB who report directly to Putin's office, basically. So the idea that he wouldn't be aware of this is farcical. The idea that, you know, he would approve of this is also seems extremely likely because just the high level of communication. Around likely, no, no smoking gun. Yeah, that's it. There's no smoking gun, but it seems so very likely based off the information that we're seeing. Do you worry about your own safety now? I mean, you, you are touching some very sensitive issues. You are, you know, the, the GRU and the FSB of Russia intelligence agencies are not to be messed around with. Yeah, you know, the more we research, we more we understand that it's not just kind of big, famous, you know, important people they go after, but everyone. Um, and, you know, I've been, spoke, you know, I've had the uh, local counterterrorism police in the UK talk to me about my safety, give me advice on how I can be kind of more safe. Um, when I travel abroad now, you know, I will stay in hotels, but not eat any food in the hotel. I'll kind of go to the local supermarket and buy a sandwich rather than eating in a, you know, a restaurant or anything like that. Uh, Chris Ogrozev, our lead researcher on this stuff, is also has to be very, very careful now because, you know, we have strong signs that he's been followed in the past, photographed. 
um, had a kind of other very suspicious activity. And again, he's been in contact with the local police frequently about his safety. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean you're not being followed, right? It's true. Elliot, last question to you. What, what's the future of Bellingcat, do you think? And what's the future of sort of people's intelligence agencies? Because a lot of people have watched what you have done. Uh, and there are other organizations that are, I think, branching out and moving out in the same direction, that they're able to do a lot of things that they didn't think that they could do before. Yeah, and what we're trying to do more is build a wider network of kind of volunteers. So we're building a volunteer section for Bellingcat where we can direct efforts to certain kind of subjects we're working on. We're doing more and more collaboration with different kinds of organizations, and we find that extremely effective at kind of taking our research and bringing it to a range of different audiences. Um, we're moving into different areas. We've done some work recently on conservation issues, you know, uh, illegal logging and those kind of things. Um, so we're constantly expanding into new areas. We're working now on kind of doing more um, things like documentation documentary productions so we can bring our what we're doing to a much wider audience um, so we're continually trying to expand grow and reach more audiences and get more people involved with open source investigation it's it's incredible and it's great to talk to you and uh, you guys have you know as a journalist i have good deep respect for you because you've uncovered a lot of things um, some some remarkable investigations so i look forward to more of them and elliot great to meet you and talk to you that's great. Thanks for having me on. And that's our backstory on Bellingcat. We will be watching for more revelations from them coming soon. Please subscribe to Backstory and share it. And I now write a regular Backstory newsletter on Substack, danalewis.substack.com, which I invite you to read. Like this podcast, it's free, but you can also become a paid subscriber if you wish to. I'm Dana Lewis. Thanks for listening. And I'll talk to you again soon.